Thank you for attending Worldwide Slot Car Chat number 56. I am your host, Greg Gaub. Today we have most of our regulars, John Kitt, Petrucci, Big Den, Don, Leo, Dennis, Alan, Chris, Dr. Ray, all kinds of people. And we're going to chat about slot cars. John already said he's got some show and tell. So John, show and tell. Oh, you weren't ready. <laughs> no, well, you, I, I muted because I didn't want to interrupt that absolutely fabulous intro, by the way. And it's nice to see you're practicing. Yeah, absolutely. I can do my announcer voice too. Ha ha ha. <laughs> For only $49.95. <laughs> Wait, there's more. <laughs> Wait, there's more. Okay, so hang on a minute. Let me just get this going here. And I will share screen. Uh, this is the final of, believe it or not, uh, the 356. Um, and let me just share this for you. Here is the chassis. Of course, this is comedy, I'm sure, to uh, the respective expert chassis builders. You know who you are. Um, but that's what I kind of did. Now, now just to let you know what I tried to do here, this is an 030 motor. There's one piece of brass here that goes uh, to the guide. And then um, these pieces of, uh, I, 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 they're, they're really spring steel, hold the front axle. And they're soldered to the pan uh, at this point, as are the mounting points for the body. And maybe there's a better shot there. So this actually moves a wee bit, but it's controlled by, uh, at least to the upper side, to, by this, this um, axle tube. So that's the chassis which actually goes really, really well. And here's the car, which uh, turned out really quite well. I'm dropping uh, Gordana home. Um, uh, I took 50 from your wallet. Oh, hello. Um, so there, there's, uh, it finished. I'm just, getting a white, I'm just getting a white screen right now. You're kidding. OK, yeah. hang on. It's a very, very bright color scheme. Oh, there you go. Oh, I'm sorry. My, my apologies. I, I, I hit next and something must have happened. My apologies. So here we go. Let's, uh, let's try this now. Is that better? That's the light blue on a track. Right, exactly. Yes, it's, it's been finished and uh, hand painted. What I'm really, really surprised at, and you know, I, mean, I shouldn't be saying this maybe, but look at the, the way that that photo etch, um, I, I, I guess, lack of a better description, what, what would you call that? I guess the, the, the uh, uh, well, badge. Badge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, came out. I, I'm just like. See totally, you. <laughs> totally amazed at how well it, it, it turned out. And putting the steel in the sides of the car really turned out well. Um, the photo etch for the back um, grill of the engine worked out well. Um, really quite pleased. And it goes around. And, and this is a, a Chris trick. I used. Um, furls for the exhausts and it, uh, it it goes around really really well and there's the chassis from the underside looks great yep so there and there you go so um again i i, I would i really like to hear what you I, again I, hopefully you can see dennis and, and chris that there is you see there's some movement from i guess this solid yeah. mm -hmm. here and yeah, i think can, you, can see that although personally i would have extended the solder back now towards so, the motor right until the end of that piece of wire. Oh, so you put it here then? Put it all, well, you know, it, you could, I would have started it there and then moved forward uh, to a point wherever you wanted it to, uh, to end to give you whatever little bit of flex you want at the front. But certainly I wouldn't have left just that center of the, that center of the pan. I would have, you know, if, if that length from the front axle to the front of your solder joint there is how much you want, then take the solder from that point all the way back to the end of the, the end of the wire just in front of the motor. Um, oh. It's probably more than anything. It would be a strength and uh, and an aesthetics thing. Um, if you look at the if you look at the top uh, view, John, top view, oh, top sorry. view of the chassis. Yeah. Okay. So this and, one, yeah. Yeah, and and quite honestly, what I what I see there is an iron that's not hot enough. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Because the the solder hasn't really melted and run into the and run into the joint. Oh, right. So, it should run all the way around along. Correct. Here. So what so what I would have done there, if uh, and maybe you can try this on the next one, 
Yeah. Uh, I presume that you put the you put the steel rails on first, right? Yes. <clears throat> so while it's on your jig, put the steel rails on and start your soldering from the back end right next to the motor. Oh, from here. And then yes, and heat the heat the wire and the brass up and allow the solder to flow with the heat as the heat propagates forward. And then take your soldering iron off when the when the solder is getting to where you want it to be. Okay. So, so not, not just not flowing. just when it melts, but where you allow it to flow. Exactly. Gotcha. And then, and then once you've done both sides, then put your pans, your side pan or your side mounts in position, and then come with the soldering iron from the other side, from the outside, uh, from the again from the back of the pan, yeah. right there, and then and then move it forward slowly, so that it carries the solder up to where it was on the original joint between the between the wire and the center pan, and then it will look so so neat and tidy. Right, and then you get a nice little fillet of uh, solder right into the joint. Use lots of um, lots of uh, flux. Uh, acid flux. Right, and w the amount of solder that you've got there right now way too much would, would do both joints on yes. each side. Right. right. Yeah. But other than that, it's a nice idea. I like it. Yeah. Good. Very cool. nice. Very neat. Very simple. Um, and uh, I bet you that it works like a charm. It, it does because it's, it's relatively light because it's yeah. not a very heavy gauge of yeah. brass. Yeah. And and the, the body is so light that I, I think it's actually, I haven't done this yet, but I think it's faster than the actual model kit that I made. Because of course mm -hmm. the body's I think lighter than the model kit because I made everything work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. And the tube at the front, is that just a piece of brass tube? Is that one of my guide tubes? No, it's, it, it's just a brass. I can't afford your guide tube. <laughs> If, if you, um, what are you using for flux, John? Actually, you know what? I'm, I'm still, I'm kind of using that plumber stuff yet. I know I should be using that uh, liquid acid flux, which will probably help with the flow issues that, that Dennis was talking about, right? Yeah, it would make, it, it wouldn't help. It would make like a dramatic difference. Oh, okay. Um, well, that would help then. And, and the, other, the other thing you could do if, um, if you follow Dennis, Dennis's advice, which is, which is certainly good, if you're finding the front end a bit too stiff, you can always go to one gauge narrower in terms of your wire. Oh, yeah. Right? Gotcha. That'll, that'll give you a little more flex. And yeah. then the last thing, right where your cursor is now, it's, um, you, it's probably good if you can. Which was nice of her. I didn't expect it's that. Just mute mic. Oh, there he goes. Okay. Oh, sorry, say again. I'm sorry, Chris. I missed that. Um, uh, on your guide tube, yeah. it looks like there's probably not quite enough guide rotation in the way that you've got the right where your cursor is now, the, where the, the, the pans go out at the side from the back of the guide tube. Yep. You may just want to put in a guide and you, you, 60, 60 degrees of rotation either way is 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 nice. It's it's plenty. So you may need to take a file or a grinder and just grind a small U, like go back into the guide tongue a little more, right? So the guide can rotate a little more and, and you'll be in great shape. Okay, like around here, right? Yeah, just it, put the guide in and, and turn it either way. If you've got 60 degrees of rotation, you know, Disregard what I said. If if you don't look where the the um, top of the guide hits that guide tongue, right. and then just grind a little bit out. Okay, cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. Actually, let's let's see if this. You can't really see from this. No, yeah, I can't really see from this photo. I guess. Uh, but that's a TSRF was. guide, so you probably have a lot of movement already. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah, the yeah. TSRF guides have much more clearance around the post. Yep. than the other guides so he's probably good chris yeah cool well I, I i'll tell you it's it's a real fun little thing to run around the track especially since i don't have to worry about scratching the paint or you know the only thing that'll fly off would be the windscreen and that side mirror everything else is buckled down like it's cast in while we're talking about the the setup of the car uh, what you might want to do at some stage john is to pull those braids uh, and remove the braid from the clip and put in some 
uh, slotted racing braid or NSR racing braid. That's a bit, that's a deal thinner than that stuff. Yeah, that stuff this is, is really a, thick. Like I really have is, to bend the heck out of it. Yeah. This is a very light car, and uh, you really don't need commercial uh, track style braid in there. Yeah. Uh, it'll be difficult to keep the front end under control with that amount of braid. Yeah, so, it, it, you're, you're absolutely right. In fact, I had to adjust the height a little bit because of the darn braid. Whoops, I'm going mm -hmm. the wrong way. Because of yeah. the darn braid, you can see I got the wheels on the on the track, but it really took a, a, a wee bit of fettling to, to get that to happen. Yeah, yeah so putting putting regular um, 132nd scale braid, thin braid in there uh, will make a big difference too. Okay, no, okay. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Other than all that, John, it's a great job. Oh, other than that, yeah. Well, listen, I, I'll tell you, I, 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 you know, again, I, I defer to you folks because you guys really know. I look at your chassis and, and uh, weep with joy and, and anguish at the same time. John, well, it's it's just it's just practice. I, I, if you if you had a looked at Dennis's first chassis or my first chassis, yours looks good. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I would agree with that. Like it, it's not, it, you just got to keep doing it. Okay. And, and the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, I mean, I, I know this is sort of, you know, stone age uh, as far as an approach to what you folks do, but, uh, you know, to get the kind of movement and, 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 and the intricacy of, of chassis that you guys do, like, any, any hints, suggestions, you, you know, uh, <laughs> are more than welcome. For, on for, that size of car and with that size with that size of motor, I think you've yeah. done a great job. I think it's going to work like crazy. Yeah. Um, if you were doing that same style of chassis on a uh, on a, a car that had a lot more tire and a lot more motor, um, I would think about soldering a piece of a piano wire right down the center of that pan, all the way from the motor uh, to the to the guide holder. Uh, just so that it didn't twist it, so that it didn't bend in the middle. Yeah. Oh, so, so you, you put a, 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 an actual just piece of steel yeah. right along the middle? Oh, you're, you're, you're muted, Dennis. Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, yeah, from where your arrow, from where your cursor is there, yeah. you just tack solder it there for about a quarter inch and then lay it on the thing and tack solder it down at the front for a quarter inch yeah. so that it makes like a little spine down the middle. And that would stop the that would stop the the um, any kind of lateral or any kind of longitudinal flexing. Yeah. And, um, uh, but you won't need it on that on that car with that amount of power. The, right. the way that you've got it is great. And those side pieces once those side rails once they're soldered to the back, that'll stiffen the rear end up as well. Yeah. Okay. That's I, great. I think no, so it's it, very nice. I like yeah, it. No, no, it's it's over over the years. Um, the most important thing in chassis building is to build a flat square chassis. Right. Um, whether you make it out of popsicle sticks or whether you make it out of straws or whatever you make it out of, a poorly executed uh, high-tech design will not outperform a well-executed, pretty basic, simple thing. Well, and you know, uh, I, I, I got to say one thing. I, I do know that the thing is flat and square. <laughs> well, that's that's all you need, um, you know. For low, as Dennis said, for low for low horsepower motors, tight short tracks, uh, skinny, relatively low grip tires, um, you know, all the hinges and flex points and all this stuff look cool. But to be honest with you, you're not going to notice a big difference in performance. In at that level, once once you start putting in more aggressive motors and grippier tires and all the rest of the stuff, chassis design becomes much more important. Okay, great. Well, again, th uh, thanks to you all because um, this project went really, really well. And um, you know, I, I, again, I, I uh, really appreciate all of you guys' input and, and support. Really, thank you so much. Yeah, Petrucci wanted to say something. Go ahead, Petrucci. Oh, sorry, Petrucci. Sorry. You know, when you scratch build, how do you line the wheels up? Oh, uh, actually, I used a, a jig um, that was, I, I guess it's, it's, it's like a ceramic um, filter. It has a whole bunch of little holes in it. And believe it or not, they line up really, really well. And that's, that's how I made sure it was square. And then I measured with a vernier caliper just to make extra sure that, that the wheels were square. Jig, jigs are great. Um, but going back into the late, the late 60s, 
ish when I first started building chassis. I used to use a piece of plywood with holes drilled in them or graph paper. I just I couldn't afford like it, I couldn't afford a jig. Um, and there's probably been more chassis built by the by the pro chassis builders back in the day on a piece of plywood with a bunch of holes grilled in it that um, you know the new stuff is great um, it it it's wonderful um, you know measure twice solder once it's that's probably the biggest thing you can do no I think I think you're right can you still you buy these jigs sorry can you still yeah, buy the jig oh the jigs you can buy everywhere. I've got a picture of it. I'll have to look, have to look into that then. There's a there's a company called Precision Slot Cars, uh, which makes a big variety of jigs, and they have a couple of jigs uh, specifically. I think they're called one thirty second scratch builder jigs. I've got a picture somewhere if you're interested. But for thirty second scale cars, they're wonderful, uh, and you can buy those uh, both in an imperial and in a metric. Uh, base depending on which you're more comfortable with they're probably going to be a hundred bucks I guess us ish somewhere around there um, but they're invaluable even for plastic cars if you're setting up bushings and putting in actual tubes and, and all the rest of the stuff in plastic cars they are wonderful well and, and as you said Chris as long as it's flat and square right it, the, the the two most important things in any chassis by far are that it's flat and then it's square. Cool. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, guys. Bye. Appreciate that. All right. Um, oh, Leo's got a, a jig. Let me focus in on that. Oops. Uh, so I've got the chat thing on my screen. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, Petrucci, this is a um, jeweler's manufacturing plate um, available from a company called Cooks and Gold in the UK. And it has, you can probably see, it has all the holes aligned and they supply little pins. The pins plug in wherever you want. So you yeah. hold the axles parallel I've, to each other. I've like got that. one of those. Right. Well, like I said, I've... Yeah. I was trying to figure out how to do the wheels, you know what I mean? How to get the distance between the, yeah. the, the axles. Hmm. Better Difficult. measure that. Yeah, yeah you I, just I, I, measure it. Petrucci, if you, if you look at the body, you know, you won't be off by much. Just measure one side and make sure that the, the measurement is the same on the other side. Yeah. yeah. Petrucci, if you go to Beta Classics, they've got the S SCD um, jigs in there. Who's that? Beta Classics. Beta Classics. Classics. Yeah, the SC jig is the SCD jig has been around for oh almost as long as I've been around, and <laughs> um, and that's a hell of a long time now. Uh, but no, that's a that's a great little jig, especially for one thirty second scale. Yeah. Uh, but it it's it's pretty basic. The the, the precision slot car stuff. Uh, the nice part about that is if you buy that, you get you can get the jig with jig wheels and axles and pins and everything. It's all one deal. Yeah. I could share a screen if you like and show you the picture. Yeah, go ahead. I've got one, should I go and get it? Sure. Yeah. No, Dennis has got one. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Ah. Yeah. I see, so you That's what you get from Precision Slot Car. Uh, I can't remember, this is, the, this, is the, this is the Imperial version. So the wheel, the wheel bases are marked. The, the basic reference is the rear axle, which is on the right hand side. And then the front, the wheel bases are marked to the front and the guide lead ahead of that is marked to the, to the front. Then there's a little, there's a little uh, 3 16 pin that goes in there. Unfortunately, it's all made for like for a 3 16 pin. So if you want to use uh, smaller guides like the 3.4 or 3.7s that we use, uh, on the scale auto guides and others like that, you really you have to make your own little adapter. But then they also provide a set of um, a set of jig wheels, uh, the big ones with the four numbers on them. Those have the ability to set up different sizes of of wheels. The front one, the the smaller ones are for the are for fronts. Um, and these were made originally when when we out here in Southern California were running a retro thirty two yeah. class. 
And so yeah. they're made for, I think, for 615 fronts with 15,000 clearance and for uh, a number of different sizes of rears with 40,000 clearance. Um, so that's how those that's how those are worked out. So what's all the, the holes in the middle for then? These holes in the middle are for pieces of, you put pieces of, of uh, your little stainless steel pins in there to hold the rails going fore and aft I see. Uh, from the keep rear the end to the front end uh, to keep them square and parallel. And then down the middle, if you have the kind of chassis that requires a center spine, then there's a set of holes there that would hold a, a two millimeter, or no, a 16th of two millimeter, uh, or something like that, and a 3 30 seconds uh, um, uh, piece of wire down the middle if you needed it. It's a very nice little, it's a very nice little jig. Is that the one that's made of Corian? Um, yes, they're all machined from Corian. And then he has a similar he has a similar one that is uh, all done in, in in metric sizes. Although the pins themselves are still in imperial sizes. Right. So now I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you for helping with that explanation, Dennis. Does anybody else have anything they want to show and tell? New, new I do. Well, Big Den's raised his hand, then we'll get to Chris. Go ahead, Big Den. Yeah, well, all this talk of 3, 3D printing and things, I thought I'd knock up something myself just when I had a spare hour or so. Of course, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Um, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is my new slotted DTM car. It's the Ellen Law um version only just come out in australia um one thing i'm a little bit surprised about is the the, the lack of clearance in standard form I, I cannot get a piece of 1 16th brazing rod under that chassis with the with the standard wheels on it i'm tempted so, uh, to say that's good but i won't <laughs> yeah, well 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 if you well if you need some clearance in, in your club rules dennis mm -hmm. it's not much fun at all no true then, I hear. yeah I mean, the colour mightn't appeal to everyone, so I actually got a couple of special accessories um, that went with it. A couple of rattle cans in random colours, you know. That... <laughs> the best colours. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it looks kind of gold rather than, than yellow. But I'm, I'm going to say that's the lighting. <laughs> so okay. It's just our bright sunshine down here in Australia at 4am in the morning. That looks nice. It's a nice looking car. Yeah. That, that, that chassis yeah. actually works very yeah. well. And the, yeah. the stock tires are not bad at all, I found on wood. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, the, the, other, the other thing that's good for me is that yeah, when I'm accused of driving like a girl, now I can say, well, it's appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for showing off your new stuff, Big Dan. What you got, Chris? Uh, I got actually just want to go back. Um, to the jigs just for a second. Sure. Um, this one. Is it up? Yep. Same as Dennis's. This is the metric one. Um, great for brass and metal chassis building. Also really great for plastic car building. Um, if you're putting in front axle tubes, et cetera, et cetera, aligning bushings, uh, they're wonderful. Uh, and these little blocks on the metric one, uh, there's different blocks. This, the outside is, this, this would suggest if you're using, uh, if you put this face down and use a 20 millimeter tire, you will end up with two millimeter clearance. So they're really neatly um, marked. These come in one and a half mil clearance. Uh, actually, the one on the back you can see is one and a half mil clearance. So you can flip them around to set your clearances. Um, I like to do this for plastic chassis. Lift the chassis. I have the blocks, so the chassis is just a snick off of the off of the uh, setup plate, so that there's no. And then when I set my bushings and ride height and axle tubes, any potential little twist uh, in the chassis is taken out of play. So, so Chris, the, those numbers are actually with the tire on the rim, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So, so if, if this was down, right? Yeah. 
and I was using a 21.5 mil tire with a two mil clearance block, I would I would get a two mil clearance underneath the chassis. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And that and that's that's assuming that the chassis is built right on the deck of the um, of of the actual block. So. These are great um, for a variety of reasons, not only for, um, you know, uh, brass chassis building, they're great for a bunch of reasons. So you're, you're essentially using it as a setup block then? Uh, well, yes, a glory, yes. Um, I, I think, again, back to my comment, things should be flat and square. Right. When I use, when I use the setup, you just have to match them left to right, obviously. But if, if I set my bushings and axle tubes or whatever, all nice, flat and square, um, that's going to be a good thing. And the inside, the inside little pins, as Dennis was saying, I, you set the inside pins to your wheelbase, throw an axle through both of them. So that makes sure both the rear axle and the front axle are parallel. Um, you do see you know, some scratch builds on the forums. And when you look at them, you can sort of tell that the axles are not parallel. <laughs> so this really goes a long way uh, to helping that. But I imagine that would all happen also in plastic uh, chassis as well, that you could like, basically straighten one out. Oh, absolutely. Um, the next one is the finished uh, McLaren that I was doing the other day. Very nice. Nice. That turned out so, so well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty pleased with it. And I think the new owner is going to be pretty pleased with it as well. Um, How do you let that out of your hand? Seriously. <laughs> uh, it's, I, it, it's a plastic car. Um, it, it doesn't have the same, I mean, I, I certainly like, I mean, you, you know, I, I mean, once I built it, I thought maybe I shouldn't sell it to him. Maybe I shouldn't send it. But anyway, you, you know, it, I just don't have the same affinity for this as I would uh, like a 60s brass kit that I. Oh, okay, so I, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Would you, would you not build a, a, um, a, a, you know, a body in parallel and then build one of your chassis to go along with it, perhaps? Uh, Yes and no. Yes. I mean, I've got, I've got tons of cars in cases that because there's no class for them, I'll never run them. Like I just, they're great to look at, but you know, who are you going to run them with? They, they won't go in a class. Um, so, you know. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to be the devil on your shoulder. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, it's it's a um, in person. It looks no less good as it does here. I mean, it. it I'm I'm quite pleased with how this turned out. But um, yeah, the only thing you need is the cigarette in Rossberg's mouth under his helmet. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know this Nick, uh, Yeah, this is Kiki, of course. Yeah, so he, yeah. he did smoke yeah, and this, as I remember. Yeah, this this is how the car ran for practice in the 1986 Portuguese Grand Prix. It never ran in a race, and it never ran again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that it was. I I was a huge KK Rose. I love KK Rose. Um, and I thought this was, everybody's going to build the red and white Marlboro cars and they're going to make Ferraris and stuff like this. So a few things separate this. All the NSR cars here have the side vents. Um, so I filled those in and then the McLaren actually, the side pods are a bit different shape, but it had some vents back here. So I cut some vents in it back here to make it look a little more McLaren-ish, but it's not, you know, Anybody who knows what the car is will go, you know, that's not like. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's wonderful. Oh, my gosh. Well, and then I just have, uh, not that anybody's hugely interested, but um, it's running rules for this one. Is that up? Yep, chassis. Yeah, that's the... Um, 
fairly standard. I, I did a few little things um, to the chassis, but- so, that, um, so that's the one that's underneath the body, Chris? Yeah, well, yes, this is, this is this is for a guy who's his club has a uh, they're running in the NSR class so he sent me his rules so I, I couldn't I mean you just can't do all of the things that you would like to do or want to do you've got to follow the rule sets but certainly for a wood track getting rid of that FK 180 motor and putting the S can in makes a big difference massive difference yes oh yeah huge uh, so on Chris this one, yeah, on this one, I just, um, I used some different bushings. Those were aligned. Uh, I've used a sonic uh, steel pinion, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, spacers on either side of the crowns, so you'll never lose gear mesh and silicone uh, wash. Is, is that a solid front axle, Chris? Yeah. Uh, yes, but it is, and I, I have glued a wire. I glued, I soldered a little uh, steel washer onto one end, and well, so yeah, I, can, I can see some sort of silver there. That's why I'm asking. Sorry. Well, yes. Um, he just painted the axle right. Colors. Sorry. You just painted the axle black. Well, I just used a bit of a sharpie on there. Oh, Formula okay. One cars do not have solid front axles. Everything runs off of the upright. So I built this thing and I'm staring at it and all I can see is the bloody chrome axle through all the push rods. So I just took the body off and, and took out a sharpie and just ran it up and down the axle to hide the thing. So there's no, uh, you know, special nitride coating secret stuff on my axle. It's just a bit of sharpie. Next time use a, you know, well, on this it doesn't help, but next time use a different color sharpie and that'll really mess with the guys, with the guys heads, you know, use yeah. a, use like a red or a green or something and, you know, make sure that it's a special coating. And, and special then just, just cargo just sure, fast coating. Exactly. Just be sure to have the product to sell them at the, at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Chris. So two, anyways, that's it guys. Two questions, Chris. Uh, first question. The sonic pinion, that's a 48 pitch pinion, right? Uh, no, it's, it's one of the one. it's one of Ernie's. Oh, so it's, it's, it's a Phil, yeah, it's a Phil Hackett made pinion. Oh, okay. But it's a, but it's an, M, it's a, it's a 0.5 module. 0.5 pinion. module. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and, and the, I mean, as you know, those, those pinions are just. Oh yeah. They're great. They're and just, then second question, um, have you tried, and what do you think is the difference between using the two mounts that are either side of the motor as opposed to the two mounts that are at the back of the part? I, to be honest with you, I have not played a lot. Um, I tried it. I really didn't see uh, a whole ton of difference. Um, so purely from an aesthetics point of view, I put the nuts and bolts uh, amidships. So okay. you couldn't see them sticking out yeah. of the diffuser. All right. Um, yeah, we've, I've, I've done some experimentation and I, I do find the cars a little smoother, a little less chatter under acceleration if the screw, if those two mounts are at the rear. But other than that, there's not a lot of difference. Okay, yeah. thanks. Very nice. Chris, have you got those rubber rings under those nuts? Yes. Um, I have, there's, there's one uh, between each pod lug and the under, and there's one on top of the chassis plate underneath each pod lug, yeah. and there's two above each pod lug underneath the nylon nuts. Okay, I like it. The and it runs. It's it's you know with with a bunch of little things done and a little bit. It's it's just gorgeous. I like the black tip. Uh, Sharpie pen on the gear as well. I do that. Well, that's that's actually uh, that's I I know that that didn't work well, so I just used some flat black paint on there and just spun the crown and it it it's just from the back of the car you just don't see an orange gear yeah. sticking out. So I I you know it took me ten seconds to do it and I thought it was worthwhile. In, well, the back of the pod as well. Hmm? The back of the pod as well. You've done that. Yeah, I, it just looks better than. It's a red plastic, but that's, you know. When I've done my Sonico one, you were saying about the bushing in the bear, in between the crank. Where do, what, what bushes are they? Did you make them or did you buy them? 
bushings? Oh, the spacers. Yeah, spices. Sorry. No, the the spacers are all slick. I I I have a big. I I like slick seven spacers. Um, unlike a lot of the typical commercial grade or the the plastic car spacers that you'd buy from Scale Auto or Slot End or any of those guys. Uh, these are very, very highly precision cut and they're polished on both ends. So unlike a lot of the photo etch spacers that slot it sells, these are, these are definitely a step above. Uh, you can buy them in uh, various thicknesses from five thou right up to a hundred thou. So putting the spacers on either side of the ground, on the crown and the insides of the bushings is, is a pain in the ass. Um, at the end of the, you know, at the very last one, I, I have to, you know, this one wasn't bad. That's, that's a 15,000 spacer with a hundred spacer behind it. And it worked out perfectly to set my latch. On in here, after I put this on, I had to put a five thou spacer past this one and in between the face of the bushing. So you have to pull the axle back slightly to create a space and use tweezers and put this five thou little thing in. It is a pain. I swear, I curse, I jump up and down. Um, once done, the only thing that can happen, when, when you run stoppers and spacers out here, you run the risk, um, especially in a proxy event, for anyone in proxy events, over time, these wheels with the tiny little rub screws will move laterally. It just happens. Um, so if you have spacers out here or stoppers out here, they will move a little bit laterally and that will affect your gear mesh. Once they're in a fixed space between the face of the crown and the face of the bushing, they, they're not going anywhere. Like they can't move, so my mesh will not change. Yeah, you said that when I when I showed when I showed mine, and yeah. I took all the ends off. But what's the name of those? The company that makes those spaces again? Uh, Slick Seven, S L I C K, numeral seven. You might be able to get those um, from Andy Brown Searle. Uh, AB Slot Sport. You can definitely get them from most of the commercial. Uh, uh, spots in the states like PCH slot parts, um, Professor Motor, blah 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 blah. Yeah. All right. They're they're no more. They actually, the, the neat thing is, um, they are no more. They actually, in a lot of cases, they're much they're cheaper than buying stuff from um, uh, you know the the photo etch stuff from Slotted. Um, and precision wise, it's in a different way. That said, um, everything counts in small amounts. So okay. if you're club racing and you're finishing fourth or fifth and you think, okay, Chris told me to put slick seven spacers in, you're not going to all of a sudden win. Like it, it's everything counts in small amounts. And wait, Chris, those... if you really want to hide that, uh, that axle. Sorry? Uh, if you oh. really want to hide that axle, a carbon axle, uh, axle will do that for you. Uh, I'm not seeing my picture. I'm it's, not seeing my picture on the screen. Can you guys yeah. see this? Yeah, screen. Chris is still screen sharing. Hold on. Oh, okay. sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going. There sorry. we go. Let's go. If you really want to hide the axle, carbon axles are the way to go for the front. And it suited um, it suited this uh, Lotus quite well, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's nice. And, and I would do that even if I wasn't worried about the aesthetics, uh, the carbon front axle and titanium ah, rear ah, axle is the way I go. Uh, and you can ah, see that I don't care about the color of the contract, you know, I still all the color of the pod. Yeah. None of that matters to me, just straight up performance. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's what this is for. But yeah, the carbon axles are good, but the tip is really don't ever use them on the rear axle because carbon has very good longitudinal strength uh, but it has very little rotational strength. Right. So you'll find that the, the axle twists. Uh, and and it's an early experiment. I did. It's an early most experiment. Most straight. To do that, and they don't work at all on the rear. And Where, Alan, do you, do you run independent front wheels? No. Okay. So running an independent front wheel 
the way that Chris does, where one wheel is actually rotating on the axle, yeah. is probably not such a good idea with a carbon fiber axle. Mine's running independent. On a carbon fiber axle? No, on the steel, same as Chris. Sorry? Yeah, I, don't know, I don't know that I would run, I, I would prefer then to use a titanium or a hollow steel axle if you're, yes, getting, hollow. if you're getting the cars to run, or if you're getting the wheels to run, to rotate on the axle yeah. rather than rotate with the axle. Yeah, yeah, the, the wear on that. And that's, that's the same, where do you get, whose titanium axle is that, Alan? Uh, it's a slotting plus titanium okay. axle. Um, <laughs> titanium axles just, unless they're very good quality, a couple of steps up from slotting plus, uh, they wreak havoc with bushings. I, yes, I don't use bushings. I use sealed bearings okay. uh, when I'm using titanium axles. Yeah, there, there's, you know, a lot of controversy on this. All high-end slot cars, really fast slot cars, good slot car builders use steel axles for a reason. Don't leave us hanging. What's the reason? What's the reason? Strength. Uh, ton, tons of reasons. Strength, stiffness. They're, they're stronger. They're invariably straighter. Um, a good quality uh, drill blank. Cheap, cheap titaniums will score when you put a grub screw in them. Uh, they're brittle. Uh, they wear out bushings. They're not particularly straight. Yeah, because I, 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 to your point, I, I like using grill blanks for the rear, but I just use like piano wire for the front. Hey, well, sure you can. I mean, in the front, it's less critical. It, it's certainly less critical. And, and you know, once you get up the pecking order in terms of speed of slot cars, they don't even use front axles. So, um, yeah. yes, for 99% for, for of racing, they're fine. Um, I, I just think you can do a lot better. You know, guys will say, well, the, the, um, you know, center of gravity is reduced with a, a lighter axle, you know, the center line of gravity is usually, or the center of gravity is usually measured upper, upper below the center line of the axle. So if you're taking weight off of the top part of the axle, that's matched by the weight you're taking off below the center line of the axle. So inherently, your center of gravity really hasn't changed. You've 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 dropped a you know tenth of one thousandth of a gram. Um, you know, a lot of a lot for of this me, stuff is. For me, Chris, it's just the straight up weight. I can save two or three grams. I mean, how? How do you stand? I will. I will sometimes use hollow steel axles. Yeah. I don't have a strong opinion. I don't think they're as good as a titanium, but I use those if I'm using brass bushings rather than steel bearings. I mean, have you found those useful? Uh, again, everything counts in small amounts, Alan. And and, and don't. It, this is. I think Dennis and I sort of relate some of our thirty-second scale stuff to stuff we've done in the past, which is certainly much more critical. Um, you, you know, you're not gonna do any harm running a, car, a carbon axle. Um, if you really want to run titanium axles, I would definitely investigate getting some good ones. And slotting plus are not good. It, it's just not, it's a low grade titanium alloy. It's not titanium, it's, it's an alloy. So, um, you can uh, you can go. I mean, th there's a bunch of the high end guys like Coford and Cohosa and a few guys make some really good titanium axles. Um, really good has a price tag. Again, uh, will will you know if you're finishing third with the slotting plus plug slotting plus axle? Excuse me, and you put in the Coford axle, will you finish first? Highly unlikely. Um, but again, it's, it's all tiny little bits. Okay. Thanks for that. I had a tip by the way. Um, you mentioned Keki Rosberg smoking, uh, and I, I was preparing a car for a proxy that's going on at the moment, the UK road race proxy. 
And one of my cars is the SRC Capri. And I thought it was a very nice 1970s kind of thing. I thought, what do I do to this driver to really make him look like he just doesn't care? And one was an open face helmet and the other was a cigarette. And the, the way I made the cigarette was to take some sprue material. You get this off just about anything. You buy a slot car, yeah. you know, from say the, the wheel plates. Um, and just hold it over a light or a candle and just yeah. stretch it. Yeah. And then wait till it, you know, then you've got a really nice thin piece. You just cut it, bit of red on the end, bit of super glue, tweezers, and into position. Uh, it's really sort of easy to do. Perfect. Uh, the, 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 next, the next step is to use a piece of fiber optic, light it so that if it's at night, it looks like he's actually smoking. I think it was yeah. Carrera that made a, that made a road going um, Morgan uh, Aeromax. Yes. And the driver in that smoking a pipe, as I recall. You realize, Alan, that that cigarette is going entirely against your absolute belief in taking weight out of a car, though, don't you? Uh, I, yeah. I, hope, I hope you thinned out that red paint that you use for the end of the cigarette. Uh, well, I, I took a whole load off the helmet to make it an <laughs> open space. So I think I offset the cigarette. Okay. Or, or you could just symbolically throw one out a window and be a cigarette lighter. Could be. If the, if the head structure had been good enough, I wouldn't have even given him a helmet, but there you go. Yeah, I got that, John. Ouch, ouch, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to a uh, high macro photo shot, photo of your yes. uh, dude with the, uh, the cigarette hanging out of his mouth. So you better get those pictures taken and share with him. <laughs> we'll see. It's on the proxy now, so it's not going to be coming back for a while yet. And probably not with the cigarette. So you're going to have to replace the cigarette and then take pictures. <laughs> yeah. They're due here in two weeks' time. So I'll, I'll take photos. Oh, oh there you yeah. Go. Okay. Thanks. Does anybody else have anything they want to show and tell? Any new? Go ahead, Paul. You we'll know, we're talking about buying fly cars, taking them apart, throwing the chassis away. <laughs> I, done it again. I bought that, which is. That's the Lola, uh -huh. and I've stuck a, an Amato chassis under it, which is, it goes like stink, absolutely. Who, who's, whose rear wheels are those, Paul? Slot it, slot it, uh, hubs and NSR rubber. Nice. Uh, and, and nice that you did Bonner, uh, Bonner's car, that's nice. Yeah. I don't know if you can see how low it is. <laughs> wow. Where's the blue? Yeah. <laughs> the blue? The hell, what the hell kind of a color is that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm, I, I tell you what, right? I'm, I've entered um, another Can Am race. <laughs> and you see what happened to the last two Can Am bodies I had. And. Uh, <laughs> I, John will know this because he already knows I've asked him the question. I've gone and bought myself a honker and I'm trying to find out what colour purple it is. And then John, I was talking to John and said to him, does he know any? And he sent me a link and I found that Pato's does the um, decals for it. But I've gone through every dealer in this, well, in my area to find out if they can mix up passion or pa pass on purple. And none of them ever heard of it. I said, well, it's a 1967 color. Well, no, actually, the, the, well, the, the color was actually named after a Ford executive because it was basically what they had in, in, in the Holman and Moody bin and just sprayed it because it was used for a Fireball Roberts car. It was leftover paint. <laughs> so I've got to now get that done. <laughs> and a Surtees uh, Lola I'm doing as well. So well, I'm big. I can assure you, Paul, that your honker will run much better as a slot car than the real car ever did. Yeah, it's going to have all NSR running gear underneath it, so it's going to. <laughs> I'm sticking a P68 chassis straight underneath it. Done. <laughs> well, show us that when you get, a, get it all taken care of. Yeah, I will. It's, I say, it's, it's, I've had to order the decals from Pato, so that's going to be about, I don't know how long it takes from come from Australia now. Um, probably about three weeks. So, and the body should turn up tomorrow. Uh, I've just got to get the paint. That is the hardest thing. Trying to find 
a sickly metal. Oh, did he disappear? Yeah, I think uh, we the, paint poli the paint police got him. Well, his his <laughs> the, his connection was obviously d dwindling, uh, but hopefully he'll be back. Uh, Mike, you waved your hand. Did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, I've got two things actually. Um, NSR nine seventeen ten showed up. Mm -hmm. Ah, nice. Um, it's it's not quite as good as the fly as far as the detail work. Oh yeah. Um, but it's it's still pretty nice. You can see the rear a little bit there in the front. And then I finally succumbed to the ultimate slot tire. Yep. Get your Mosler. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm starting to think I have a thing with yellow and red for some reason. Uh, the yellow I get because I can see the damn thing, but yeah. um, but the red, I don't know. It just seems to go well. So, as, as opposed to your yellow and blue, Greg. Of course. I mean, you know, I'll give you the yellow. That's not, that's not, you know. Yeah. Say, I have to admit, though, that I like the Sunokos. If they come out with the Sunoko, I'll probably have to buy it. Yeah. Which, which they probably will. Which, uh, which, show me the bottom of that, Mike. Is that, that the 180 or the S-Can in it? It's a Sidewinder, yes, with the, it's with a side the, the Evo 225K. Okay. Good, good, good. That's, yeah, yeah, that's the good one. Yeah, that's better. That's the yeah. good one. It's probably going to be too much for my track. You know, tune, tune the power down at first. <laughs> They're fast cars, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, I had right. to get one of those myself, so... Oh. <laughs> Same livery and everything. Yep, yep. How you like that one? Oh, you've got the inline one though, don't you? Yeah, can okay, inline. Wow. Uh, it runs quite nice. I like it very well. What little bit of running I get to do anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody else got any show and tell? I didn't see any other hands waving. Any projects anybody's working on? Looks like we've already gotten through most of that stuff. What you got, Dennis? Have I told you guys that um, that I'm helping a, the, the family of a departed friend who raced slot cars with us uh, to dispose of his slot car collection? I think uh, you mentioned it. But I you... might have mentioned it a little while back. Yeah. Um, it's now happened that I have uh, the guys, everything that the family did not want to keep is now with me and I'm in the process of cataloging it all. Um, so once I've got that done, I'll let you guys know. Um, this guy's tastes in uh, slot cars were very, uh, very wide ranging, fortunately for, for everybody, because it means that there's stuff for just about anybody here. <coughs> there will be about 100 132nd scale cars that I'll be wanting to, to move. Um, a, 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 lot, a fairly large collection of slotted stuff, including Porsche 956s and 962s going all the way back to the, to the Kenwood and Cannon cars, right? So or, right the way back to the very first couple. He's got, I wouldn't say he's got every livery, but it's very close to every livery of 956 or 962. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are a couple of other things. There's some Formula One cars. There's a couple of uh, Thunder slots is a couple of NSRs, things like that. Uh, and then I've got probably about, I would guess, um, about four, 25 to 30 uh, 124th scale retro cars, uh, some built by me, some built by a, a guy in, in Japan, um, some built by others. And then uh, of his own stuff, that, stuff that he built himself, I probably got about a hundred 124 scale hard body uh, slot cars that have been built. They're all uh, with um, brass chassis and so on. But as I say, I'm going to be uh, cataloging it all. There are race boxes, there are tools, there's a tire truer, there's power supplies, there's all kinds of things like that. So uh, over the next couple of, uh, probably the next month at least, uh, I'm gonna be doing that. And then I'll start letting everybody know I'm going to try 
to you know first approach people who knew this guy. His name was Jay Henry. Um, he was a very a very well known uh, audio engineer and uh, 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 music producer. Um, with a couple of Grammy nominations and things like that. So very well known in, in other circles too. But uh, I'll let you guys know when this is all done. Uh, oh, hang on. I mean, I'm sure you're gonna, you're gonna answer this next, but basically is this gonna, is this all through you? Or are you using the help of Electric Dreams or some other shop thing or? Right now, it's all through me personally. Uh, I'm trying to get to the, my friend's son to set up a dedicated um, uh, um, PayPal account so that I don't have to transfer the money so that it goes directly to them and the family. Uh, he has two young sons, and uh, this would make a big difference to a, to a, a college fund for them, I'm sure, because there's going to be a... There's a lot of stuff, man. There's a lot of stuff. Anyway. Dennis, is, is part you know. of this also setting up like a quick little website with photos or something? Uh, uh, I'll think about that. Uh, certainly the first thing that I'm trying to do is to get a, is to get a, a spreadsheet together with, you know, catalog the whole lot. Um, you know, when it comes to slotted cars, uh, really all I need to do is just give you the guys the number, mm -hmm. tell right. you this is a, you know, this is a slotted Canon 956 uh, CA01B or whatever it is, uh, and it has N22 tires on the rear. And other than that, it's in it's in perfect condition. That's right. all I'm I sorry, I, I, was, I was I was already thinking about the 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 builds that he made because that, that's where I get a little excited. I mean, gosh, it must he, he, well, they must be really really nice. A lot of, a lot of them are very nice, uh, but they're pretty much all 124 scale, uh, mm -hmm. John. That's, that's quite a that's quite a task and, and kudos to you for for doing it. Thanks. Yeah, he was a he was a really good friend. So um, uh, you know, it's something that I'm doing for his family. But that's it for me for now. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to updates on that, and hopefully, there's a there's an easy way for you to share pictures of the things that aren't just catalog items <laughs> in the future. Uh, and yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk about that again. Uh, Paul, I heard your name kind of chime in a second ago what what were you gonna say i froze out after i was talking to yeah. you i don't know if you it all froze and it chucked me out so i don't know what i missed I, i'm i'm just glad we now recognize your alter ego yes. yeah well it's always been that you know that in it my laptop is now on another 100 percent mark download whatever it's doing i'll tell you what right that thing does more downloading and updating than it does <clears throat> ever get used yeah, I feel like stamping on it sometimes. I think the only thing that you missed was that Dennis is helping uh, sell the slot car collection of, of a friend of his who passed not too long ago. Oh. Uh, he's going to keep us up to date on that. Is Lock your is your new favorite color now pink? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> it's still blue and yellow. Here, let me fix that. There. <laughs> all right does anybody else have any show and tell or things they want to talk about ask about circle back on uh or shall i look in my list go ahead big yeah i was I just gonna say I, I thought paul paul's cut favorite color would be green you know Teresa green <laughs> that's her nickname don't go on it uh -oh. <laughs> Alan, what were something you Go ahead. This is something uh, that uh, me and a bunch of other guys are starting to get interested in. Uh, it's a TR7, yeah. The, nice. the least fashionable top removable Triumph. And it sort of started as a joke because one guy refurbed a Triumph TR7 Skeletric model and he put uh, an Amato chassis underneath it. And I thought, you know, I can do that. I've got one of those. And it was this car, when I had this, this is probably the oldest thing I own that I remember receiving. I mean, I have a teddy bear on my shelf that I received when I was nine months old, but I remember getting this to the set. And I remember how disappointing it was when I put it on the track. <laughs> and I think everybody had that. So I thought- Sorry, Alan, know, but it, 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 modeled, it modeled the real car in that respect though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
totally. So, you know, two or three of us, well, there's three so far, maybe there'll be more, are getting these old shells. You can pick a, a working model up off eBay in the UK for probably about £15 or something, and you throw the chassis away, um, and you, you choose something else. You can either use, uh, this is my solution, the Slotted HRS2, uh, and I choose that because I can change the body at a later date and use mm -hmm. it as a different car. Other people are using the Amato chassis, uh, and there are various other things, uh, other well, 3D chassis. I, I love the wheels. The wheels yeah, are nice. Cool. Yeah, they're just looking less by the looks of them. Uh, those are SRC wheels. Oh, SRC. Yeah, and I are they the, like are they the real wheels. like little mini lights? They look really good. Oh, yeah. Those, yeah. those are just that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted mini lights for this car. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, although they're slightly bigger diameter than I wanted, I really wanted, you know, something that really had that look. And this is this is it. So cool. SRC. Oh, look, that looks great. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the really what was the body, um, Alan? Was it Scalextric? It is a Scalextric. It's oh, a nineteen seventy okay. Scalextric and the, yeah. the resin is cast in yellow, some are cast in white, some in blue. Uh, and the only difficulty I'm gonna have is that uh, the back of the old chassis uh, contains the detail of the lights, etc. So I've had to chop that off, and that's going to get inserted into the body at the back and glued into place, yeah. uh, and then masked and sprayed. I think I'll probably spray this. I have no idea which color I'm going to do. But doing this kind of thing, chopping up chassis and putting them on the back of the body, is a kind of a typical thing that you would do for disc racing. But they do that for the diffusers, yeah. uh, chop them off the back of the chassis, put them on the body. So that's that's just sort of the start of my little project. Actually, um, you know, Alan, um, I think I think I think you've I think you've struck something there because Scale Electric's also had a lot of those like nine five nines or nine six twos. Yeah, that looked okay. Right. But you, you could kind of do the same thing with it. Yeah, there is a thread on Slot Racer online, and uh, if you go to Slot Racer online. You'll find it. There's now two threads. One's called TR7 refurbs, and one's called 911 refurbs. And, and Scale Extric also made a mini. And I, I pity the poor soul who decides <laughs> that he thinks he wants to get that working and racing and send to a prop. Because that oh. really wouldn't be. I don't think that would be a plan that would work. I don't Alan, think there'd be any benefit in that. That uh, the red motorcraft TR7. Someone around the corner from where my granddaughter lives, just well, it's just over about a mile away from him. He's actually got that on his drive, covered up, clamped up, and everything. Wow, he's actually got a replica rally car of that thing sitting on his drive. Has it, has it returned to the earth yet? Because they have a tendency, no, to do that. It, you can still see it's a TL7 outline with all the lights on the front and the mini lights. and all the clamps. <laughs> but the yeah, longest but, time, those cars were nearly worthless. You know, the TR7 yeah. was the least favoured. Nobody wanted that car. Mm. It was an awful car anyway. I mean, one of the worst that they have ever made. You know, it's, and, uh, and it's only in reasonably recent times that the, uh, the TR7 has come back into favour and people want to buy them and restore them. Yeah, well, Triumph is the only car company that went from independent rear suspension back to a solid rear axle. Yeah, most American car manufacturers never made the leap to a <laughs> independent rear suspension. Right? Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they do now. And Alan, are you are you going to do it up as a? Are you going to refer it as a rally car, or are you going to make it into a into a road race car? I am going to keep it as a rally car, and okay. the prime reason for that is I have the bumper with the, um, the front with lights, the lights and everything, yeah. Okay. yeah. And I don't really want to start chopping that away, so I'm going to keep that. Okay. Um, and it also means that cool. if it's, uh, I can ca count it as a rally car, I can mm -hmm. race it down at London Skull Extric. Yeah. You know, that, that'll you be good. You did. Well, sure wait, wait, looks like Wayne's got one yeah. up and with the headlights up. He really mm -hmm. wants to share that. What are you showing us, Wayne? The, the uh, uh, WSR 3D TR7. Okay. Okay. Can you so see that? Yeah. I see a bunch of pictures. Can you can you choose one of them and? Yeah. Which one would you like a look at? The one with the kit of parts. That that sounds good. Yeah. There we are. That's already got the rear end on the chassis. 
and I think um, that's available as a kit supplied exactly like that. I just wondered if anyone had come across that one uh, amongst your group, Alan. I'm sure I've seen this picture before, and I can't remember where. Um, w, sorry, three D dog There is one called George Turner models. Is that this one? Because they make a TR seven. George Turner's is is different. George Turner's no, no. one is a car chassis. Okay. This one uh, allows you to run the body shell really, really low if you want to, like this. Oh my God. <laughs> Looks so stupid. That's low. Super low. Actually, That's the body shell mounting is something that I I'm going to struggle with with this TR7 build because the uh, I've never I've used the, the HRS chassis before, but I've always managed to match up body posts or create body posts. And in this one, I may use the side mounts, but I'll see how that goes. Well, there you go, a bespoke solution. Can't tell you the price offhand, price on application, I suspect, but it'll Chris be the same for yeah. all. Chris and Dennis will tell you that that's the only way to mount a body is off the sides. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was that was pretty easy. I've only done like one or two HRS, you know, chassis to body things. And the, using those side mounted pins was super easy. I, yeah, it was like it was the, to me it was the, even the, is, and, how comes and, Alan has still got the headlights and all the rally lights on that front bumper? Because if we raced it like we did with kids, they normally went first. Same as on the escorts. Yeah. Well I was I was so disappointed by it. I think I used it for half a day and put it in a box and I never used it again. Because right. it's got no body posts. So you know, using the side mounts uh, would be the right thing to do, I think, for this car. Well, good for you, Alan. I, I, I think it's great when people just don't search for the best, like back to your mini thing. I think it's great when you pick a body style and then try and engineer it to work as good as it can possibly work. I, that's a lot of fun. Um, good for you. I think it's a kind of an English thing. I think only English people try and take a black cab and turn it into a dragster or something. Or, you know, crazy things, you know, take a, take a Ford Cortina and make it into a pickup. I mean, people are still doing that kind of crazy stuff. But you've mm -hmm. also got a car that's going to be really unique. Well, except for the other two or three that have already been built on <laughs> slot rate. <right? laughs> that's the thing. You know? I didn't start it, but I jumped on the bandwagon. Now, it's, oh, you know, now the bandwagon is gaining a bit of steam and speed. So let's see how it goes. I've got a mini <laughs> for you too here. Similar affair, slot it pod based. All pod. <laughs> it's all pod. Nothing to it, but that's based on the scale electric mini body shelf. Oh. And there it is built up. And that one, if I'm not mistaken, he's now got that one where the uh, number plate is the body mount. Oh, okay. Oh. So yeah, you just it, once, sort of, once, it sort of clips in at the rear, like the NSR. Um, yeah, I don't Fiat think this and, um, and the Renault Clios do. Hmm. Yeah, I think this it's is an early one. one does as well. But he's, I'm pretty sure he's got that going as well now. It's in there. And there it is, naked up from the top. You know what just size there. wheels he used there? Can't answer that question. I don't know. Um, They'll probably be 10 mil, will they? Yeah, it should be. Um, RS Slot Racing has some really nice uh, scale 13 inch wheels, and they've also, uh, Colin's now done uh, some 10 and 11 inch mini wheels that are really neat for the old minis. Cool. Yeah, because a mini's not right. A mini's not a mini if it has, if it has anything bigger than 10 inch wheels, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it did get 13s in production. Oh, I know that, but that's not a proper mini. Oh, okay. You know my favourite car from that period, um, Scale Electric. And actually, as a kid, I got the TR7 came as a pair. The other car was a Capri. Yeah. And that car was way better on the track than the TR7. It actually worked. It didn't look that great, 
And I did dig that out. I still have it, but it's it's about 55 millimeters wide. It's completely unsuitable from yeah, one reason. There was the Porsche and the BMW 3 litre CSL also at the same time in that kind of rally range from the mid 1980s. And of the bunch, I think the pick is probably the BMW. Well, listen, those were still better than the Elden cars I grew up with, where the Ferrari was almost like 124th scale. I like the BMW M1, the, uh, the Spanish scale electric style, but they just had the rail, they, the RX boats were in them, didn't they? Yeah, at the at the Hyundai trains. Yeah. Yes. Well, anything else? Should I dig up a yes. topic to talk about? What you got, Petrucci? Yeah, let's hope. Anybody seen the Sideway GT40? Yes. It, it, GT40 was it was it the, the GT3 no, the G, GTE. The, the four GTE? Oh, GTE, yeah. I've seen photos. A they white look one. quite nice. It's a white kit, I think. Mm -hmm. Which is wondering if anybody's got one yet. Nope. They aren't out yet, I don't think. Sorry? They're not out yet. Yeah, no, certainly not out. Certainly they're not on this side of the Atlantic, anyway. No, I think, I think they're in Australia. I think I've seen one painted up. Wow. I'm not sure I might have been mistaken. Well, they'll probably run better than the Scalectric or Carrera. <laughs> the oh, Scalex God. one doesn't run that bad. It's pretty nice. No. The Carrera one's horrible, but the Scaly <laughs> one's not bad. Actually, I've got a Carrera that works pretty well. Um, it's at just least a, as good as the Scaly. It's yeah, heavy, then, but... And it, and it looks wrong because the nose is about three feet off the ground. True. You know? True. It's got well, to be a stupid guide system there. Sideways is turning into my favorite mark, you know. I mean, I, for me, I'm an NSR guy. And when I started slotting again five years ago, it was NSR. That was definitely the best thing to have. Never bought into the whole slotted kind of ethos. But we had to run uh, sideways cars because our club runs Group 5. And so I started to get used to Group 5 cars and sideways. And really, they're really quite good, you know. I've got a Capri and the M1s. Uh, I got the Celica. I've yet to mm -hmm. test that out because of the oh, it runs well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got the Hurricane, which really runs pretty well, you know. And, and they mm -hmm. run, you know, that that NSR proud boast about ready to race. You know, they're they're okay most of the time. They're a lot better than any others. But sideways, most of the time, they're all they're a, a par. They're on a par with NSR as far as build mm -hmm. quality, and that's amazing considering that they're built in China. <laughs> And the other manufacturers that build their cars in China have horrible problems getting the build quality up. I love their white kits. Just paint can I, can I just circle, circle back to one thing, Paul? If, if you look at Nick's uh, picture that he's got up there, that purple that's on that uh, Ford GT might be close to the honker that you're looking for. Look. See, the See that purple? and it's too dark is it too dark yeah? yeah okay i was just trying trying to help sorry where are you looking good try but uh, on on the avatar of uh, nick kersel's avatar oh okay uh, it's that wind's purple and i think it's too dark for the for the it it would do in a it would do in a push mm. but uh, it's it's not quite lilac enough there, there, you, there go. you go that's it i actually spoke to uh alan nemesis and asked him, uh, no, Alan, Michael Nemesis, to about what colour he used, and he said he had it specially print, it specially made in Germany. Yeah, that would be Michael Nemus. Yeah, Nemus, that's it. Close. <laughs> I can see how that colour would be hard to match. At least and, he didn't pronounce it with a P. Well, as far as topics go, the one that jumped out to me was uh, somebody who is interested in hearing opinions, methods, results, pros and cons of implementing a racing handicap system. So rather than have you all kind of guess at what this person is wanting, I would say speak only of your own personal experience. If, if you 
currently or have ever used or taken part in a club with a handicap system of any kind, simply explain what kind of club it was and what kind of handicap you used. Uh, Luff has a fairly interesting way of racing. Can I put you on the spot and have you tell us about how you guys do your racing with pretty much any car, Luff? Sure. Um, we usually do four or five laps, practice laps, just to set a, a lap time. And then you decide what you, what time you want, what lap time you want to dial in. And that's, if you go faster than that, you're out of the race. So you use software? You yeah. put in a, a target lap time in the software? To a tenth of a second. To the tenth of a second. So let's say I'm running practice laps and I'm and I'm consistently getting, you know, 5.6 seconds or yeah. something like that. I would say I want my lap time to be 5.6 seconds. And you would type that into your program? You might want to go 5.8. <laughs> Five point four because after a certain number of laps you start going a little quicker, you know. Okay, so anyway, so we have a little toggle switch, the driver station where you can adjust the time up and down on the monitor. Okay. And then, say you go five six, somebody else goes uh, six six. You would get a, a one second head start, and they depending on how many laps you go, like say, say five laps, you, you'd have five laps to catch him. Okay, so, so if, he's, if he's doing laps that are a second longer than yours, then he would, get, he would get a head start, right? Yeah, the computer decides how, how much of a time difference there is, okay. depending on how many laps the race is. We, we race, uh, Sometimes 10 laps, sometimes five. And when, when we had enough beer, we'll erase one lap. <laughs> what's, the, what's the program that you use? It's uh, one of our guys wrote the program himself. Oh, special. It's, it's really slick. Because uh, like we've got guys that have four or 500 cars. Yeah. And now they can run every car and be competitive. I, I think we talked about this a little bit before. And and the person who wrote that program doesn't really care to put it out on the internet for other people to download. It's pretty much just for you guys, yeah. right? Yeah, he has to make up the the wiring. Like there's a like a control box and a bunch of wiring that you have to do to the driver stations. Yeah, so he's integrated it into the hardware that he's familiar with. Yeah, so he basically sets the whole thing up. And then you pretty much custom make the thing to fit the track because of the, the cable lengths are different. Yeah, it's the same guy that did the hill climb the the, the, the polarity change at the top is just mm -hmm. software. Mm -hmm. and, and he wrote that program too. But I'm thinking as long as somebody has a track power system where each lane is individually controlled yeah. power, then a suitable software could be updated or written to have some I think so yeah yeah but uh, we, we if, if once you dial in your time and you break out it cuts the power to your lane so if you so if i say i want to do 5 5.8 5 and i run a 5.7 it'll cut me down yeah nice <laughs> and then and then usually we go four or five races per lane before we switch lanes so you can change your dial-in time after every race. Yeah. What so happens, if you, what happens if you run a long lap? Like if I say 5.8 and then I run 5.9, that's fine too, right? That's fine. That's what you want. So if I, so what if I run a 6.5? Is there like a way too slow breakout or just a way too fast breakout? No, you can go as slow as you want. Okay. I mean, that makes Everybody, sense. Right? If you want to lose. going to be getting that much closer to you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, if you want, you know, side by side racing, you just pick cars that are close to equal. Yeah. And then everybody so, starts at the same time. So let's, let's say I run some practice laps and I'm running at five, six, and I decide I'm going to dial in at four, six. That 
changes you would, really you would have a really long wait before you got to go right okay yeah i guess yeah, true that would that would start that would just give everybody a bigger okay i was just trying to work out what happens you know because obviously yeah, you, you can you can, you can you dial can. in a time fast enough that you're never going to break out but then you're also giving away distance in the in the race okay i got it oh, thanks yeah. they'll, they'll I got be all it. over you within one lap yeah i got it sandbagging doesn't help you can't cheat that's the beauty of it <laughs> yeah, that's, that's you can, really you can, the guys that that are consistent at lapping, they they always do well. And yeah. and there's guys that that'll run five sixes like for ten laps. And, yeah, and there are hundreds of a second, yeah. But it's it's just fun, you know. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great way. I'm gonna I'm gonna and, see if there's some way. When you run uh, like through two minute heats or whatever everybody if you don't bring your fastest car you don't have a chance and this way there's no rules it, it doesn't matter what you do how much money you want to spend it doesn't matter oh but luff come on there is one rule it's called beer beer <laughs> beer yeah. is a requirement <laughs> beer and, and urethane tires that's the only rule we got there you go. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you talking about that for us, Luff. Did anybody else have any questions about how their how their handicap system works? I think that's pretty that's pretty unique and, and clever. I'm gonna talk to some race management software people and see if they can think of a way to do that because I know a lot of them have already have ways to control the power. So if the track has a way to control individual lane power being turned on and off, then that could be added as some kind of a new race feature. I'll, I'll send you Roger's email address so you can, you can get in touch with him. Okay, cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I guess if you have a if you have a race timing system that doesn't have the ability to control lane power and therefore doesn't have the ability to cut someone out of a race, as long as you have the ability to recall everyone's individual lap times, you can look at the lap times at the end of a race and see if anyone has actually ducked under, even if they did complete the twenty lap race. If one of their laps is underneath their uh, target time they've cut themselves out without knowing it or our timing system calls out everybody's lap time every lap yeah so, so you can tell how close you are to your breakup yeah I, I think what wayne is saying is that even if even if such as such a hardware married to software solution can't be done you could still have just the software decide at the end of the race you know you could still tell it what your target lap time is and you're trying to meet that target lap time and you could still have the software do nothing more than call out the lap time of each racer as they as they make their lap and then at the end of the race you know they lose any laps that are under the time or they're disqualified or something like that so they think well, it's we not had, be, before roger wrote this program we we had the track broken up into uh, I forget how we figured it out, but sometimes 18 different sections. Mm -hmm. And if you're two tenths uh, different in your lap time, that's two sections back. And each section is like three feet or whatever. So everybody starts at a different spot on the track. And then yeah. you still, in theory, everybody wow. ends up at the finish line at the same time. The slow guys get a head start so that basically the, the idea is that everybody ends at the same more yeah. or less at the same time. Yeah. Yep. That's another way to do now, it. Now, now Greg, in, in digital racing, is there not, uh, no sort of adjustment you can do in oxygen or something to, to try and, and get a handicap system going? Oh, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways to do handicapping. In track right there. Yeah, I mean, lots, well, lots of things can do it. So that's why we're going to go to the next person. Does anybody else have any handicapping experience? And if so, what did you or your club do? Anyone? Bueller? No. Okay. From, um, a couple of commercial tracks. The, the latest one that I was helping at was Mini Grid. And we had, amongst other things, a big four lane plastic track to get more guys involved with, without thinking they needed a whole ton of experience and to spend a whole lot of money. We just put a, on certain classes, we just had a breakout time for the whole track. So depending on the class, I would take a car, put some tires on it, do some basic rudimentary tuning, again, depending on the class. And then we would set a breakout time that was still, it was still fast, 
Um, the top guys could obviously beat it, but the lower guys couldn't. And it was just set in the computer, at, you know, pick a number, five seconds. If you did a lap under five seconds, the computer just wouldn't count it. Um, so we didn't run it in all classes. Um, I'm not a big fan of breakout racing personally, but that's it. It worked well. It got a whole bunch of guys coming back thinking that they had a, a, a chance. And again, depending on the class, I would set the bracket. So um, we had a lot of guys coming in and buying slot cars. And, you know, dad and his son come in and buy a car for 65, 75 bucks. And then it's a bit of a stretch to tell them, well, that motor's got to go and these wheels are going to go and those tires are useless. So here's another 40 bucks uh, and, and you're going to go two tenths of a second quicker. Like the guy's going, what? So I would take a car and then depending on what we would think would be appropriate for parts and stuff, set a lap time and away you go. So it wasn't, it didn't handicap each person individually, it sort of, it, it, it handicapped the whole field. Uh, the other thing we always did again, which is not inherently a handicap, but in every series we had an A group and a B group. So we all run together. So you and I run together at the same time on the track. Um, but if I'm a B guy and you're an A guy, if you win, you, I get just as many points as you, because if, if I win the B grouping, so it tended to, um, give the guys in the bottom, bottom rankings, um, a few more championship points as we went along, because it became apparent that, you know, halfway through the season, if there's a bunch of guys who are looking at the score table and they're going, I've got, you know, I got no shot at this, you'd start getting some absentees. Um, this way, it um, bolstered the chances of the lower guys. And then from a, a, a sort of sticking it in, rubbing it in your nose position, the guy who was last in A at the end of the series would go down to B and the top guy in B would come up to A. So there was, you know, there was a little after racing, having a beer, um, you know, rubbing that in some guys' noses as well. So it was kind of cool. It sounds like uh, like a Premier League approach to uh, to club racing. Yeah. Well, I mean, mini grid is mini grids. It's a very much a social. It's it's a it's a social club. It's 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 a fun thing. What were you going to say, Dennis? Um, a couple of different uh, formats that I've seen over the years uh, in South Africa back in the day when I when I raced there, we had a driver classification system uh, in at national level, where because we were only one, racing one class of car uh, and uh, and a bunch of different tracks over an over a series of national uh, championship events, so we would grade the drivers race everybody together in qualifying and so on, and then split them out into their classes and let them and let them run eliminations and a final in each class as well as an overall one. And then, as Chris was saying, at the end of the year, then the, the based on the points and the relative positions, uh, we would um, we would promote or relegate people from one class to another. That worked very well in the days when there was one class of car. Um, at a club level, what we what I used to do, uh, because you're running the same class of car every week on the same track, you have a lot of record of what each guy is doing on that on that track every week, and so I would take that and set a target, like a scratch target uh, number of laps for, you know, for the night's racing, which would be four three minute heats or whatever it was, say 120 laps, and uh, I would work out a handicap for each guy uh, based on how close they got to that 120 laps. If anybody actually increased or, or got over that, then I would increase that number and then basically give everybody a new handicap. And again, you would race together, but uh, when it came to points, there was a set of points without handicap and a set of points with handicap. Um, that helped. And then what we would do every now and then just for fun, after we'd done with the night's racing, 
we said, okay, now we're going to have a handicap final and we would take the people and we would actually add the laps on the lap counter and stage them around the track so that in a, in a, in a, in a three minute heat, everybody was uh, theoretically going to hit the, 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 the line, the finish line together. And that worked. That was, that was a lot of fun when you have to chase from the back. Um, the, the group that run at Buena Park Raceway with the 124 scale hard bodies have, uh, again, a similar thing where they handicap there, they handicap two things. They handicap drivers, but they handicap them within a class of car because they have like, I don't know, 320 different classes of cars and they love to run these run what you brung kind of races. And so you can run a, a, a 962 Porsche alongside a Mini Cooper uh, and you know, you're obviously not going to keep up with him on the track, but when the, when the scoring comes around, there's a, there's a, there's a handicap available uh, based effic effectively on the size and uh, the different classes of cars. Um, you know, GT, GTP cars and, and Group C cars have a, a scratch handicap. Um, you know, uh, 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 rally cars have a plus 12 lap handicap or whatever. So the cars are classified and then the drivers have a classification as well, but I'm not really sure exactly how uh, the guy who runs that thing, how he works those out. It's based on some kind of average over a period of time. And I guess the only thing that's always a problem with those kinds of systems is that somebody has to establish a track record, right? You have to, you have to be there for three or four or five races before uh, you can actually get a handicap. I guess it's like golf, you know? Well, you, you've got to play a number of rounds before you can get an official handicap. But they do work well, and the concept, the concept is good uh, to keep people involved. Yeah, I mean, the, there's, there's so many different ways of, of leveling the playing field or, you know, however, however you want to refer to it as trying to make, <laughs> trying to make it more, more likely for the people who aren't as good or who are new or whatever to have to have a fighting chance you don't uh, yeah you don't want to punish uh, guys that are, are you know the fast guys exactly you don't want to punish the fast guys but you don't want to make the slow guys feel like they're they're never ever gonna have a oh, chance yeah, you, you have to feel like you have a chance at least yeah and, and so that's why i like hearing about these i'm sure that's why the person asked about more uh with with digital there are so many different ways <clears throat> for example uh, you know, depending on what kind of simulations are used with the with the digital that I run, you know, we've got tires and fuel and weather and all kinds and, and damage and all kinds of things like that. Some of the ways that that we have tried to uh, make things, you know, more fun is the better drivers would either have uh, less fuel or a faster fuel burn rate, so they have to pit more often. Uh, and or uh, less, uh, a lower number of damage points. So basically every time somebody crashes, they, they lose one of their damage points. And in order to recharge their damage points, they've got to pull into the pit lane and repair. Uh, so the better drivers or, or the ones who are able to stay out of crashes, not necessarily faster, but don't crash very often and therefore tend to win the race, uh, have less points that they can use for crashing or Sometimes you know we'll have somebody who's who's so new we don't know where he's going to be on the scale, uh, and he's new to the track and new to the new to the digital and stuff like that. Uh, you know we'll just give him extra damage points so that he's not having to pull into the pit lane quite so often. Uh, you know more fuel or uh, one of the one of the concepts that has been used in other clubs I know of has been a kind of a uh, a ballast evening system i think it's i think they use that in dtm or some other kind of racing where they basically weigh down the faster cars so that they are more even in in digital slot racing that's not really all that helpful to physically add weight to the car but we can tweak the fuel burns uh, simulations so that uh, while let's say everybody else is getting 75 percent of full power when they have a full tank the guys who are always in first position will only have 65% of full power on, on a full tank. And 
And, you know, instead of 100% power on an almost empty tank, they've only got 90% or something like that. So that doesn't always help those. As, as many of you know, sometimes slowing a car down makes them faster. <laughs> so, you know, we don't, we don't have a, a prescribed regimen for how do we make the, the races more even. I can't just go and say, okay, well, Mike gets this much and Greg gets this much and the new guy gets this much. It usually tends to be, you know, we race around, we have some fun. And then, you know, the more we race, the more we understand who tends to be, you know, first, second, and third, and who tends to be down low. And then we just kind of throw some numbers around until <laughs> until we get it a little bit more even. I'm, I might have to try some of these other ideas. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing more from you guys. Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to toss out there, Big Den? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it didn't occur to me that we actually have a handicap system um, down here until I started listening to what you guys do. Um, some of you people might know that we have a full-size tarmac rally down here called Targa Tasmania, where people go out in var you know, various classes, various forms of exotic and less exotic um, um, cars. Um, you know, it runs over about five or six days. On the slot car track, we decided to run a Targa class so people to uh, you know, get a chance, like um, Luff was saying, where you could you could run your your, your less competitive cars. So you would do a, a one minute qualifier to establish a median median lap time. And so, for instance, if we had a one minute race, the guy that you know, set a time of of, of twelve, uh, of, say five seconds a lap, would be expected to do twelve in a minute. The guy who's getting around in seven point five. If I do my maths right, he's only got to got to get, do eight. So uh, then you you, know, you you compare your actual scores at the end of the race to, to your what, what your median you know, median qualifying time said you should get, and so that you, you get points. Um, you know, I'm not sure of the formula that the guys that run the show uh, use, but you know, you score points or lose points uh, depending on how close you get to your ideal target. Yeah. So instead of yeah. so instead of being eliminated for going too quickly, you basically get a plus or a minus score or a higher or a lower score if you are closer or further away from what you are expected. Yeah. How many laps you are expected to get? Yeah. I, I mean, if you yeah, if you t you could you could lose points if you're uh, uh, you know like t too far below or too far above. So someone getting the uh, the like the Goldilocks series, if you get it just right, you know, then you'll get you'll score maximum points. Cool. Yeah, so we've only, we've only ever run it a couple of times, and and uh, you know, of course, if you if you come off a couple of times, you're not going to get anywhere near your time, and which is which is why I very rarely win those things. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that we did, and I think I think just in general, having a variety of not only classes of cars that you race, but a variety of types of racing helps kind of keep things fresh. Uh, and, and that's, that's a great idea. I think I'll bring that up with the, with the analog club guys, because you know, we've been basically each race night, we start with a King of the Hill, which I've mentioned before, where basically everybody gets 10 laps with, with the same car. Everybody uses the same car. They get 10 laps to try to get their fastest lap and they can crash as many times as they want. You know, the, the best lap is what counts. And then the, the next race meet the people who uh, are getting the best times go first because it's going to be a completely different car on a completely different track. And a lot of times motors get better, tires get better, you know, various things change from the very first run of that car to the later runs. Never mind the whole everybody else gets to go to school by watching the first guys race the cars. So oftentimes the guys who go first because they got great times before, and it's also cumulative, right? So if you keep getting the best times, you're pretty much always gonna go first and eventually you're gonna get knocked down the list because you're gonna end up putting a car on that's got no traction at all until the tires warm up or the track warms up or whatever the case may be. Or it's just this bizarre car that that is weird to figure out and everybody else gets to watch you screw up <laughs> and then do better on their round. And then the next thing we race is IROC, right? Everybody's most most familiar with IROC, you know. So 
club cars basically or or host cars and everybody races the same cars everybody rotates lanes but the cars stay in their lanes everybody has to run the, every different car and so it definitely becomes more of a, a driver's kind of you know who's the best driver kind of situation versus who's the best car tuner or both and then we run our series cars so every race night is is king of the hill i rock and then series cars so every race night is a variety of races uh, but we've been doing King of the Hill for a while. We had we had a time where we were doing what we called rally, which was um, you had a set amount of uh, laps to get, and you tried to get them all in the quickest time. But the downside to that is that marshalling, of course, had a huge impact on you know how how good your time was, and so everybody had to be on their on point with their marshalling or else the driver, you know, gets up, understandably upset about a slow marshal, you know, ruining their time. I mean, don't crash, obviously, then you can't complain about the marshal. But I think that big Dan, I think that idea is an, is a new, a new spin on a different way of racing that I think the guys will probably get a kick out of. So I think I'll, I'll see if they see if we can work that into replacing uh, King of the Hill for a while because I think a lot I think some of the guys are getting kind of tired of the King of the Hill format <laughs> because it's been the first type of race for so long now. So yeah, thanks for that idea. Anybody else got any? I mean, I'm gonna air quote handicapping because you know that that kind of has a a connotation that a lot of people don't like. Well, how about we just call it equalizing? I mean, you know, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a word that's going to make everybody happy. <laughs> so handicapping, equalizing, funifying, whatever, you know, you want to call it. Balance of power. Balance of power, you know, whatever. Does anybody else have anything that they do or they've heard of? Something they want to try? Question? Roger calls his system the equalizer. The equalizer, yeah. I like it. Roger. Or leveling. How about leveling? leveling? Sure. Leveling and playing field. Does anybody have any questions about any of the other things that we've talked about uh, with regards to equalizing or, or handicapping or previous subject matter of today's chat? I got about 15, 20 minutes left here. Any other topics anybody wants to bring up? I was just going to follow up for Petrucci. I had a look on our, on Pendle's website and the, um, the Ford GTE from Sideways is still on pre-order. And uh, over in Australia on an armchair racer is talking about coming in June. So I'm not sure whether anyone would have one in the flesh at this stage. Seems we might be a little bit early on that one. So yeah. ho hopefully in a couple of months, we have some people ranting and raving or... I, I know I may have asked this before, if I, if I may, but yeah, yeah, we talk about racing cars as racing cars. What do uh, you folks do with road cars? Do you just collect them? Do you actually drive them around or, you know, or movie cars or cars that aren't necessarily, you know, race cars? Yeah, well, well John, I can, I can throw one in here. It's, uh, again, I didn't think of this, that um, we did have a series down with a Hobart club a few years ago, which, you know, the car you raced had to have featured in a movie. Um, it's one guy actually run Mater from the cars um, cartoon uh, thing, yeah, you know, the little toy oh, yeah. truck. Uh, but uh, you know, there's quite a variety of things. I can't remember them all now. But uh, Mater was yeah, the point one that I, uh, or Mater or Marta or whatever you call him. I, yeah. uh, he's Mater I because he's Toe Mater. <laughs> oh, he, right. Okay. I raced the uh, Batmobile. You know the what's the one with the three fins coming off the back of it. Oh, the, uh, the 90s one. The, the... Nin, nin, no, 1989, Michael Keaton. Michael yes, the one. Yeah. I had that. <laughs> that was, it's, like, it's like a 143rd size, isn't it? No, 132nd. Like, well, I mean, they call it 132nd, but it was like way too small for... Oh, that. no, no. Mine was actually, it's about that, that big. It's a proper... I, I dig it out one from next, next say, time. Was, was, it a model it kit or, was it a model kit or was it the Skelectric? No, I got the scale electrics one. No, this was, um, I think this was a converted kit. Yeah, because I'll, that, I'll, I'll dig it out. Yeah, get it, there's get some it really out. great. We want to see that. Yeah, I'll dig it out for next time. Yeah, it's the garage at the moment. I'm not going up there now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who doesn't who doesn't love some movie cars? You know, I've I've got a small collection. You know, with the 
uh, the Mad Max car and the Back to the Future and, you know. Oh, the, well, the Bullet Mustang with the Charger. Bullet Mustang, you know, Starsky and Hutch, Dukes of Hazard. You know, I, I'm, I'm absolutely looking forward to getting the new Batmobile, this electric Batmobile, classic Batmobile, as well as the Knight Rider kit that, that they're planning to come out with. And, yeah, I, I think uh, Luff's way of, of, of equalizing pretty much yeah absolutely i'd put one of those cars on <laughs> i probably would not have a race of movie cars or or you know tv show cars or whatever because they're all so completely different they wouldn't <laughs> probably wouldn't really race against each other unless we did something that equalized things like like uh, like left's equalizer or or some of these other things yeah. i've got the horizon stairs which i'll start to build as well and uh that's still up in the box i've, I've, I've looked at it Put a chassis together and went, nah, I can't be asked. For what car? The Green Hornet. Oh, the Green it Hornet. Comes, uh, you could get the um, Batmobile. I've got the Batmobile, the, the first edition one that's got actress. I've got that and the Green Hornet as a motorized kit. Yeah. And um, I think it's AMT done it, isn't it? Is it AMT? Yeah. yeah, yeah, th yeah. yeah those, those were from the old Aurora molds in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the body's nice. The actual body on the Green Hornet car is lovely. It's just. Let's cut me ass to put it together. <laughs> that yeah, used to okay. put out the fire on this subject, but you can pretty much prove any car has, has appeared in a movie. A Ford GT has that ever appeared in a movie? Uh, Le Mans '66. You know, you uh, race yeah. what you want, then, can't you? It was in the it was in the background of that one movie that you know, that was actually my car. It happened to be where they were filming. So yes, it it's a movie. Okay, car. Oh, okay Wayne, <laughs> name a movie that had a, that had a Mosler in it. I would join the Mosler Facebook group and find out. <laughs> I, my, one of my recent ro past road cars is an Alpha 147. And a lot of people on the Alpha 147 group regularly uh -huh. ask, has the 147 ever featured in a film? And of course it is. It's in all sorts of different films, usually as a police car or something like that. But nearly any car has appeared in a film these days. Well, that, that's only because they're on set for catering, aren't they? <laughs> I don't know what they're on set for. They might be on set for um, real re uh, corrosion purposes and crashing <laughs> and uh, That's whatever right, yeah. Italian all, cars do, you know? All the florists use them for uh, fertilizer, absolutely. To be fair, I think everybody knows what we mean when we say movie cars or TV Ah, yeah, cars. yeah. That's why the I didn't want to put out the fire. <laughs> Old Granada, John White, <laughs> into a tip. Skip, sorry. Yeah. And the King of the Hill, the King of the Hill thing that we race is often where people will put the car that they they never get to race in the series because it's just so off the wall or something like that. So absolutely, we've run movie cars in King of the Hill and and just obscure, you know, race cars or some brand new car from some brand new manufacturer that that there aren't enough for us to run as a series. It'll be like, hey, try this out, and everybody's like, oh, that's awesome. We should run this as a series when there's enough cars to have everybody get a different one. <laughs> So I've got to say, I've, I've ne never ever raced under a handicap system with slot cars, but I really like the idea of both what um, uh, Luff's doing with the breakout potential and your King of the Hill format. I, I'm, we've got a relatively small group at one of our local venues, and that group can be six on a club night, and I'm sure those guys would be willing to have a go at that. I mean, everybody likes to try to get the hottest lap they can get, and so it's 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 that's an easy one. You could say, yep, 10 laps, get your hottest lap and crashes don't yeah. matter because, you know, it, I could take 10 minutes to put your car back on. That lap is already ruined by you crashing on it. So Absolutely. So doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's a great race format. What you got, Dennis? There's another thing that, uh, as you were talking about it now, that, that made me think of what we do at one of the, one of the, the guys uh, locally who has garage races uh, like once every six weeks or so. And uh, everything we do there is with his, with his cars supplied. But the first thing that he'll do is uh, it's a three lane track. He'll put out three cars. Everybody drives all three cars on all three lanes. And then we total those up. Then we take those totals, right, for each guy and we rank them. But then we, we, we group the people together in teams of three. And what you do is you take a guy from the top of the list with a guy from the bottom of the list and a guy from the middle of the list. So you even out the teams. And then we'll run 
uh, we'll run a, like a mini enduro, which will be like eight minutes or 10 minutes on a lane with each one of the guys in the team running one lane. And so you can get it. You have a chance for the fast guy to coach the slow guy to choose which lanes, you know, that they're most comfortable on. And, uh, and those races come out as, as a team race with, a, with sometimes very, very, very close results at the end. Um, and so everybody feels like they're part of it. Everybody feels like they can, they're doing what they can do. Um, everybody knows that every other team has got the same advantage or disadvantage in terms of how fast the, the drivers are. And uh, it, that actually works quite well as well as an, as an alternate uh, way of leveling the field. Well, that sounds more like a driver-focused approach rather than a car-focused approach. And also, when everybody, when it's sure. when it's one team on the track at a time, right? It's not. No, yeah, we don't do no, we don't do that. It's not okay. one team at a time. Uh, you, you, we. Let's say there's twelve guys, right? So we we divide them up into four teams of three drivers, mm -hmm. and there's three lanes on the track, so it becomes a round robin of teams, mm -hmm. and then within the team the the team decide which of the three lanes is each of the three drivers going to drive so for example let's say i'm uh, i'm the the fast guy and there and i've got two other guys i will drive the difficult lane the, the 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 slowest guy will drive the easiest lane the guy in the middle will drive the middle lane or whatever it might be yeah. uh you know, each guy has his own uh, has his own um preference for lane in any case and then you just drive it as a round robin of the teams with each team keeping, uh, keeping um, track of who's driving on which, who's going to drive on which lane. Yeah. Um, and so it actually works really well. But as John says, yes, it's, it's, it's not the cars. The cars are taken out of the question because you are still running, everybody's still running the same three cars. The, the cars stay on the lanes. And so each team drives each car on each lane. Uh, it, you're just swapping the drivers out. But see, here's, here's what I was thinking. If you if if you're dividing up into teams of three, so basically three lane track, teams of three, a team, team Greg, could could do all three lanes at the same time, right? And then each team does all three lanes at the same time. By doing that, each person on the team is going to do everything they can not to nerf the other guy because if you accidentally nerf your own teammate you're gonna make your team score lower but that's that's a cool idea yeah you still i have, hadn't thought of that yeah. it's still the same competition because it's all about total cumulative that cumulative yeah, laps yeah, for, yeah, for each yeah. team and you basically get team team greg out of the way and then you go to team dennis and then you go to team chris you know and, and each team basically has their team's chance uh -huh. of getting the best yeah, team yeah, that's a cool idea. That's yeah, what I was thinking. I would suggest, I would suggest that to them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because it's, it's the same race, except you're eliminating the team-to-team -team competition. So is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? <laughs> depends on depends on your point of view. Anybody else got anything? Any questions? Any? any... I've got, uh, I've just done a little homework and got an answer for John Kitt. Internet Movie Database. Oh, where did a Mo where did a Mosler ever appear in a movie? So it looks like database. That's awesome. It, it looks like it appeared in a movie in two thousand and two there, and the Green Hornet in two thousand and eleven. Not only a film I've ever heard of, but yeah, you've only got to ask Google, and the Internet Movie Database has come up. Obviously, it's been in Top Gear and Top Gear again. But there you go. That's how hard it was to find out. Well, there you go. And unfortunately, the Green Hornet was such a bad movie. I can't say I've heard or seen any of those. Oh, gosh, yeah. I was the one with Seth Rogen in it. They totally mucked it up. <laughs> That's Very a different wrong. car as well, isn't it? <sighs> Joel, well, now we know about the Internet Movies Cars database. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, oh, somebody mate, has to have done it. Shut that down. We don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something here, though. Talking about off the wall cars and off the wall vehicles. These I had those things. as a child. <laughs> yeah. I had both of those. I did not have them. I bought these on a whim about sort of four years ago because I just thought, I, you know, during warm up and practice, sometimes it's good to mess around with people. 
put something on the track and the first thing they'll say is, God, what's that? What is that? What have you got there? You know, what are you doing? Uh, and these are Skelet strips, sidecar setups. And I thought this could be good. I could tune these. These could be fun. Uh, and I do remember the ones I had as a kid were fun. But on a club track, these are horrible. It's, they're just horrible. And so I couldn't get any interest from anybody to, to kind of get on board and say, let's just have a bit of a mess around on Christmas or something with these, because they were just so bad that no one showed any interest. So, it's, you know, but, but, but as a motorcycle sidecar, is, is anybody racing any of these or using anything like that? If not the scale electric one, then something else. Well, there's a 124th scale uh, motorcycle sidecar. Dennis knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, the BRM one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've never yeah. raced. I bought one because they there was a blue and yellow one. So, <laughs> duh. yeah, it, it's an interesting car because it has an an angle winder uh, and it dry and it it drives two wheels, uh, but the wheels are not on a single axle. The yeah. the wheels are are offset and the one drives off one end of the of the uh, motor and the other drives off the other end of the motor so it's it's kind of weird uh, oh. they look pretty nice True. Uh, and those ones um what's the name rubber band driven because i had the first ones that had the rubber bands in them these, these do not have the rubber bands no. no these no the typhoon which was the 1960s one i had one of those as a kid that got completely destroyed yeah. Uh, but I don't remember that being, I remember that being okay. That had a pin instead of a blade yeah. guide. Yeah. So that was quite, that was proper old school. But, you know, I, it's just just a thought. I mean, I'd love to I'd love to get something like this working and do something for a Christmas Day thing, but I can't, you know, I replaced the motor in this and I changed the wheels and I did a different guide and I got the whole thing to sit low. It's still horrible. It's really not yeah, something they're, you want to do. they're gruesome. Uh, North Wales have a uh, uh, rock race with um, Ninko go karts from time to time. Oh yeah, Ninko karts are a lot of fun. You gotta just slow. You know, you know, the, you gotta turn the voltage up. Yeah. yeah. You know, on the Ninko go karts, if you put the driver's arms up in the air, they handle <laughs> twice as good. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic because I've got a couple, a couple of the guys in the analog club love their Ninko go karts. I'm absolutely going to tell them to raise their hands. What about the Ninko, um, what's the name? Oh, what's that game that they've done? The Game Boy game toys they done. They've done the little ones, didn't they? Oh, no, that's Carrera, wasn't it? Yeah, Carrera did the Super Mario. Is that the one? That's it. No. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Cartoon based. Car, or video game based caricature cars, yeah. Because Scale Electric's done the, the the Dastardly and Muttley ones, didn't they? Or yeah, in their in their, in their micro yeah. scale, yeah, yeah. And and Scale Electric did the Scale Electric has the carts and the trucks and stuff too to, yeah. to add some variety. Box yeah. be, on a skateboard. Wouldn't it be nice to to be able to have a set of real raceable motorcycles? Right, um, Moto G, Moto GP stuff. Yeah, I was really, just about I've, to ask. Yeah. I've you really been thinking that, about that really a lot. Frustrate yourself. Go buy some of those scaly Moto GP oh, bikes. They yeah. look, I have they four of them. Just but... Gorgeous to look at. Absolutely gorgeous, but they're just hideous to run around. The track. Yeah, and and SCX had one at one stage with some kind of weighting system so that the thing would actually lean. Yes, And I think that that's getting a little closer to where you need to be. But of course, the problem always is to uh, to try and get the driving wheel out of the slot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, here, here's a challenge. Try try to do it in one thirty second scale. Yeah. Yeah. Actual one thirty second. Oh, scale. actual one thirty second. Yeah, because those think, bikes are probably bigger than. I think the SCX ones were pretty close. They were they were definitely smaller than the Scalextric ones, and yes, those Scalextric ones are. What Chris was saying, I, I they were going they were going for dirt cheap at the hobby store several years ago when I first got into the hobby, so I bought four of them and installed digital chips in them, oh. and, and we raced them on my, on this track digital with R1 turns. the The trick with those cars, I mean, make sure the outriggers are are doing their job, but the, what I found was to just turn your brakes off because you want to use all the coast that they have, turn, 
turn your power or sensitivity or whatever kind of controls you have for for making the cars go as low as possible so that they're not so twitchy because they're those stinking slim can motors that are super super twitchy turn the power down turn everything down turn your brakes down and then just try to just kind of just kind of make them go and let them coast through the turns i actually have a video if you look through a lot of my old videos of us racing those things <laughs> digitally <laughs> the worst part was that we set a rule that when when you crash the drivers need to be put back on the bike and they're only held to the bike with magnets in their butts right so the drivers come completely off they have a really weak magnet in their butt and a weak magnet in the seat of the motorcycle and just getting the stupid driver to go back on <laughs> is, is a pain in the butt and then you got to get this thinking thing back on the track in the slot and then not be so frustrated that you're waiting that whole time for the marshal to put your car back on with the motorcycle driver back on that you don't just pull the trigger hard and, and come off at the next turn anyways what about the sukis did you get the suki set you know the the, the whole like scalatrics done the they done the grand national didn't they and then they done the ones with the uh the carriage behind the little two-wheel car i've seen it yeah <laughs> snowmobiles or snowmobiles that was that was strong <laughs> That was Strombacher. I've, I've got an ATV. I've got a Ninko four-wheel ATV as well. Jeez. Yeah. Oh, oh, and Avan Slotter just brought out a four-wheel ATV just a little while back. I have one of those. And it's actually four-wheel drive. It, it has a long shaft, um, long can motor in it, and it drives front <laughs> and rear. Yeah, they um, come with a banjo? Say again? Do they come with a banjo? No, no, this is... <laughs> oh, okay. The Ninko one is four wheel drive, but with a rubber band, I think. Yeah. yeah. No, this, the Avant slot has a, has a drop arm, has a whole deal. Um, I, I might actually even. Can we share movies on here? Because I actually made a jump for it. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Let me hang on a moment. Let me just cancel that and uh, let me. I'll put it up. Uh, I'll find it in a minute. I think the, I think the Ninko has a drop arm too. I could, I could go grab it, but yeah, it's just not a good. <laughs> It's just not a good. Not Didn't a good you make a review, Dennis, for Electric Dreams with that ATV? Um, I might have mentioned it in a review, but I don't remember actually making a specific one for it. Uh, where is it now? What's going on here? What's going on here? How about how about the grannies? You guys seen the uh, the the grannies in their wheelchairs? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> My bad. March. Well, Dennis is finding that the the um, we were racing the go karts for a while, and and they use little things called HT thirty motors, which is an HO size cube motor, and we bought a bunch of those from uh, Wizard and BSRT that were and made those things into just ballistic little cars. Cars. Yeah, I like the way that Greg kept talking about um, cars and drivers when they were actually bikes and riders. Yeah, uh, I can't, <laughs> I can't find it, guys. I thought it was on my computer, but it's actually still just on my phone. Uh, I haven't downloaded it. So. Well, we'll save you for next time. And we're we're way past yeah. our two hour mark, so I'm going to hit the stop button. And as always, come to a live chat so you can have fun and ask your questions and share your stuff. And until then, 